If you would, I'd invite you to open your Bibles back to the Gospel of John. If you've not been with us, we've been going verse by verse through the Gospel of John, and today we will be doing the same. It's an amazing passage that we're going to study for the second time after looking at it last week, and what we're going to encounter again is our Lord, the Lord Jesus, the God-man who left heaven's glory and came to earth, get in a conversation with a mortal, a unique mortal, in the sense that he was a religious leader, an elite in his day, a man named Nicodemus. And it's important that when I read this passage here, I'm going to read chapter 3, uh, verse 1, and all the way down to 21. It's important that you remember when I read this, that this is all one section of thought. The Lord Jesus starts in verses 1 to 10, pivoting into 11, in a conversation with Nicodemus. And then, pivoting in 10, 11, and 12 through the rest of the section, the Lord Jesus starts to preach a sermon to Nicodemus. Even the famous John 3, 16, a verse we love, must be seen in context of the Lord Jesus evangelizing this lost man, Nicodemus. So let's read it together. John 3, starting in verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one could do the signs unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, has a second birth, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed, Nicodemus, that I said this to you. You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, and you do not know where it comes or for where it's going. So is everyone who is born in the Spirit. Nicodemus replies for the last time in this section, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you not the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? And now as I keep reading here, realize that the Lord Jesus goes from a discussion and a dialogue to preaching a sermon to Nicodemus, evangelizing him. Truly, truly, verse 11, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe them, how will you believe heavenly things, Nicodemus? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the servant in the, uh, serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. This is the judgment, you could say, Nicodemus, that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear their deeds will be exposed. But one who practices the truth comes to the light that he, his deeds may be manifested having been wrought in God. What if I told you that the Lord Jesus was coming to preach next Sunday at Cornerstone? Now, whatever plans you had next week, you might change them a bit so you could be here next Sunday. Nevertheless, what if I said in this theoretical, you know, illustration that the Lord Jesus was going to come next week and he had a topic. The topic the Lord Jesus was going to talk to us about was how to evangelize. And the Lord Jesus, in his topic of how to evangelize, was going to tell us when he was to come next week, we were going to learn how to minister to people that are lost. Not just any kind of person that's lost, but a person that's actually self-deceived, a superficial follower, someone who had some 
um, some response, some affiliation, some following of Jesus, but they weren't genuine. What if we learn today that next week Jesus was going to come and teach us how to evangelize to the religious unsaved, the Bible reading unregenerate, the people that think they are found, but they're lost. We would say, wow, that would be a good seminar. And what if the Lord Jesus, if he was to come next week, and to teach to us, we were to hear that the topic of his preaching was going to be about himself. You see, we're told in the scriptures that we're not to preach ourselves, 2 Corinthians 4. Paul says, we do not preach ourselves. But there is one that's allowed to preach himself. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, it's entirely appropriate for the Lord Jesus to preach sermons about himself. Because in that, he's preaching us the very revelation and mind of God. Well, if that were to happen, which it's not going to happen, (laughs) but if it were to happen, we might argue that the passage and the place and the exposition and where we would go in scripture is John 3. That we would come to the place where we watch our Lord, the God-man, think of it, God himself in the flesh, evangelizing a lost religious man, a Bible-reading, PhD, Bible scholar headed for the judgment a man named Nicodemus. You see, the entire point of John 3, when we look at it, is included by John as an illustration for us of how chapter 2 ends. Just look at it. Chapter 2, if you remember, has the Lord Jesus Christ doing these amazing miracles, the wedding at Cana, water to wine, and then we watched a couple weeks ago where the Lord Jesus, with a rope in hand, cleared the temple of 20,000 people with pure supernatural strength, and it's emptied. And all that stands there is the Lord and his disciples. Only the God-man could do that. Well, word got out about that. People were watching that. They were witnesses of that. And of those people that witnessed that, there were some that were true followers and said, I want to follow the Lord. And they repented of their sin and they put their faith in Christ. Others were the disciples that had already trusted in him. And then there was another group. There was a group that started to attaching themselves to him as a teacher. They attached them to him as someone they could learn from, that seemed to know the word of God. One that could do miracles sent from God. But they were superficial. They were spurious in their belief. They were not genuine. They were false converts. They came for all the wrong reasons. Well, they're mentioned in chapter 2. Look at the end of chapter 2. Verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name. Note that. Many said, oh, we're going to follow him. Observing his signs he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them. Did you catch that? There was a group that started following after Jesus that said, we're gonna believe in you and follow after you and seems like a good thing you got going on and you're teaching us some Bible. And Jesus says, they're not genuine. I'm not gonna entrust myself to them. Notice it. Why? Verse 24, the middle of it. For he knew all men. He knew the heart and he knew they were fakes. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he knew himself what was in man. So we're left with this reality that Jesus is starting to do miracles. He's come on the scene in Jerusalem. Millions of Jews are there, and he's claiming he's the Messiah. John the Baptist is claiming he's the Messiah. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, and he's doing miracles, and some are genuine, and then there's a group of false, superficial seekers that start following him. And one of those is a man named Nicodemus. You see, chapter three is inserted here, even if you're looking at the grammar of this in the original, with a, with a connective tissue and a conjunction here, saying you could read it like this. There were superficial, false followers of Jesus, and let me document one of those to you. One of them was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This was no ordinary superficial follower. You remember He's a ruler, he's a leader, he's an elite. Put in your mind a person that had spent their whole life studying the Old Testament. Think of a Bible scholar with a PhD, knowledge of the word, insight into the Old Testament. And verse 10 tells us, notice it, he's the teacher of Israel. Look at verse 10. Are you not the teacher of Israel? Literally, definite article. Aren't you not Nicodemus, the one that they look to to instruct them on the law? The one that they look to, to teach them the Old Testament. Are you not the one that knows the scriptures and teaches in temple week after week? And we know he's an older man. 
Because he says in the section here, can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be reborn? So what we have before us is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in a conversation with a false follower. And we know this false follower still isn't genuine even. Because if you look at verse 2, he comes by night. He still wants his reputation. He still wants his significance. He still wants his influence in the synagogue. But he wants to inquire because he believes Jesus is from God. He believes he's kind of a peer of Jesus as a teacher. He believes Jesus has done some miracles, but he certainly hasn't trusted him as the Messiah and his Lord. And what we saw last time, if you remember, in verses 1 to 10, is we encounter the reality that Jesus told this man that thought he was very much right with God, you're lost and you need a second birth. You need to be born again. What does that mean? It means that he needed a new heart. He needed spiritual heart transplant surgery. He needed God to act from heaven to take out his heart of stone and give him a heart of flesh. His first birth birth was enough to secure his judgment. His second birth would be needed by God for him to go to the kingdom. So we saw that last week. They encountered and they talked with each other back and forth and back and forth. And if you look at verses 9 and 10, Nicodemus is exasperated by the time we get there. How can these things be, verse 9? What does he mean? How could it be, Jesus? I've gone my whole life thinking I was right with God. I've studied the Old Testament. I've taught the Bible. I go to temple. I pray. I do all the moral things. I'm a religious leader. How could it be that I'm lost? could it be? And Jesus said to him, verse 10, are you not a teacher of Israel and you don't get this? Don't you know the Old Testament? And then if you notice, verse 11, Jesus continues all the way to 21 and it goes from a conversation to a sermon. Jesus preaches a sermon about himself and continues to evangelize Nicodemus. Brothers and sisters, we need passages like this. We need passages where we watch our Lord, by the way, the most loving person that ever lived, talk to a man about his sin, talk to a man about his rebellion, talk to a man about his self-deception, take a man to the place where he sees no ability to save himself, and then also to see the Lord Jesus turn the corner and offer him the good news of himself. This right here, beloved, is for us in a a way for us to witness our Lord evangelize a self-deceived man. And so I want to think about this next section here by the way of Jesus preaching an evangelistic sermon. Because when we get to verses 10, 11, and 12 and following, Jesus goes from dialogue, as I said, to preaching. So if you're taking notes, here's going to be our outline for this week and the coming weeks, maybe two more, or maybe one. And here's what it'll be. Jesus preaches a three-point evangelistic sermon to Nicodemus. Jesus preaches a three-point evangelistic sermon to Nicodemus. Now, it's not that he hasn't been evangelizing him already. The first 10 verses, it was a dialogue on evangelism. And now Jesus is about to preach to him and evangelize him. And I don't know about you, but I love watching our Lord interact with lost people. I love watching our Lord encounter people that need to know him because my life, like yours, is full of people that I want to know the Savior. I've got lost people in my life that are outright rejectors of Christ. I want them to know the power of the gospel. I've got people in my life just like you that have some affiliation and hang around the church a little bit and I'm concerned where they're at spiritually. I've also got people in my life that are Nicodemuses that are 100% convinced they're right with God, but they're lost because their life shows they have no effects of the new birth. I want to know how to evangelize them, minister them. I want to see how our Lord preaches an evangelistic sermon to Nicodemus. So that's going to be our outline. Three-point evangelistic sermon to Nicodemus. Now, like every good sermon, there has to be an intro, right? And so there's an intro to this three-point evangelistic sermon, and I want to show you that intro. And if you're taking notes to this three-point evangelistic sermon, here's your intro point that we're going to call it. The intro is in verses 10 to 12 to this sermon, and we're just going to call it the you should have known rebuke. The you should have known rebuke. Sorry for my bad English. It fits the sermon point. The you should have known rebuke is in 10 to 12. So let's read it together. Notice Jesus begins his sermon, his three-point sermon with, this intro. Jesus answered Nicodemus in verse 10 and said, are you not the teacher of Israel and you do not 
understand these things? What is he saying? You don't understand the basics of the new birth, Nicodemus? You don't understand what it means to be born again? How could you not know that? Now, you and I may think for a second, if someone asks me the question, where would I teach about the new birth, being born again, the need to be born a second time from the Old Testament, you may not know exactly where to go. You may need some help, someone telling me, how do I learn about the rebirth, regeneration, the new birth in the Old Testament? Well, that's fair for us in our Gentile culture in some ways. It's fair for us, those that may not be as schooled in the Old Testament. We're New Covenant Christians, and so we tend to know a lot of our New Testament. It's totally unacceptable for a man that claimed and was known as the religious elite teacher of the day. This is the basics for him. This is what he should have known for no, with no problem. This is the bottom level, low-hanging fruit, bottom shelf stuff. That you need a new heart? You need a heart transplant? You need to be born again? How could you miss that, Nicodemus? How could you not see that? And what I love about this is in this you should have known rebuke, Jesus is pressing in upon Nicodemus' need to see his rebellion, his need to see his sin, his need to see his inability, and specifically his need to see that he's self-deceived. He is not right with God. The things he thinks he knows, he does not. And so last time, I mentioned to you there's a couple passages that are probably in view that Jesus had in his mind when he told him that. One would certainly be Ezekiel chapter 36, right? We talked about it last time, speaking of the new heart. But also within that, Jesus would not only have been talking about the new heart in Ezekiel 36, Jesus also would have had on his mind Psalm 87. And I want you to see it. I want you to lay eyes on Psalm 87. Such a great passage. So when we see our Lord preaching his sermon here in his intro, the you should have known intro, he's drawing on Ezekiel 36 for sure, but he's also drawing on Psalm 87. And I want you to see this because if you were ever to have a little compassion for Nicodemus and think that Jesus was too hard on him, you need to see that Nicodemus was a scholar in the Old Testament. He would have known the Psalms. He would have taught them and he missed the basics of the rebirth here. So notice Psalm 87. Notice what it says, verse one. His foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all other dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. So notice, Jesus is speaking of a holy mountain, a holy place, a place called Zion, a glorious place. He's speaking of heaven, the holy mountain. He's speaking of the place where God will dwell. And now notice this language of the first birth and the second birth. Here's where you get regeneration in the new birth in the Old Testament. I shall mention Rahab and Babylon among those who know me. Did you catch that? Gentiles. He's mentioning Gentiles, non-Jews, who have come to know the one true God and will be, notice verse 3, in the city of God. Notice, he says there, I shall mention Rahab and Babylon among those who know me beyond Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia. And then notice this. This one was born there. He documents their first birth. He documents the first place they were born. That's like you or I saying, where are you from or where were you born? And we say, I'm from Houston. I was born there. I'm from Florida. I was born there. Your first birth. These Gentiles, they're documenting the first place they were born. Okay? But notice, getting to heaven and having access to God and going to the holy city and being with the Lord, it requires you being born not just in your first birth place, birthplace. You must be born from Zion. You must be born from above. You must have a new heart given to you from heaven. Notice, this one was born there, but of Zion, verse 5. Notice it. Of Zion, it shall be said, this one and that one, they were born in her. Did you catch that? Zion is the holy mountain. Zion is the holy place. Zion is the place where God's glory will dwell. Zion is a prefiguring of heaven. Notice the ones that will be with the Lord of glory. Notice they were just not born in Philistia and Tyre and Ethiopia. They were born in Zion. Notice, if you're wondering if that's what he means, just keep reading. And the most high himself will establish her. He will establish them, establish her, and establish their salvation. And then look at verse 6. The Lord will count when he registers the peoples. 
You know what that's language of? Opening a book. It's the book of life from Revelation 21. The opening of the book and documenting who's in it. And you know who he's registering in the book of life and it's going to heaven? Not just those with a first birth, but those that have a second birth are written in the book. Nicodemus should have known this text. Notice, the Lord will count when he registers the peoples. Notice it, the one who was born there. Born where? Born from Zion. Born from heaven, had a new birth. And if we're wondering if transformation happens, look at verse seven. Then those who experience the new birth will sing as well as those who play the flutes and they shall say, all my springs of joy are in you. Transformation, absolute joy, regeneration, a new heart, a new nature, new affections, new joy. When the rebirth happens and the new birth happens to someone, I said this to you last week and this text says it, look at it. They become new, new flowing waters of joy into their heart because of what God has done. Go back to John three. When Jesus tells Nicodemus, you should have known, he's saying, you should have known Psalm 87. You should have known I require a new heart and a new nature and a second birth for God to act from heaven on your heart if you're gonna enter there. Now, I want you to think about something for a moment. If you were with us last week, you remember this and I'll review for a second to bring this to you. But I want you to think about so far in this dialogue Jesus had with Nicodemus, he's basically told him he's lost He's self-deceived. He has total inability. He can't save himself. Everything he's known his whole life is a sham. He's headed for the judgment. He does not know God. He's living in rejection of God. He's counting uh, his merits and his genetics as a Jew and his accomplishments as a Bible scholar as something acceptable to God. And Jesus says, that's all trash to the Lord because you don't have the second birth. And then on top of that, notice back in the text in this you should have known rebuke, look at what Jesus says to him. This is fascinating. Jesus says in verse 11, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of things of what we know and testify of what we have seen. And then look at the end of verse 11. And you do not accept our testimony. Stop there. You do not accept our testimony. That's language of you will not receive it. You reject it. You're resisting the revelation of God. What revelation? That you must be born again? That you must have a new heart? And if you're wondering, look at the text. It's in the plural. Truly, truly, verse 11 I'm looking at. I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify and what we have seen and you do not accept our testimony. You won't receive the testimony of me and others. Who's the others Jesus is talking about? Well, it's probably his disciples with him that are there that are testifying about the need for the rebirth and that he's the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And we don't have to invent anything. The other person he's probably speaking about is John the Baptist. Remember, up to this point, John the Baptist has been on the scene and is famous among the Jews. He is well known. Nicodemus, as a ruler of the Jews, he would have heard about about John the Baptist preaching. And so Jesus is saying, Nicodemus... You religious elite person who sits there in pretense and thinks you're right with me, you won't accept my words, you won't accept the disciples, you won't accept John the Baptist, you sit in a place of absolute resistance. You will not accept our testimony. Just as a side note, there's lots of ways that people can reject the truth and not accept the testimony, but at the center of all of it is a rejection of scripture. It may be that people reject it by redefining sin as a mental illness. It may be people reject the scripture by saying the creation account in Genesis isn't real. It may be people reject the scripture by saying Jesus can be my savior, but he doesn't have to be my Lord. I can still live for myself. It may be that people reject that the scripture is inerrant and without error. It may be fill in the blank, but at the, at the center of every person who will not bow the knee to God is a rejection of the authority of scripture. And Nicodemus is being told by the Lord, your whole life you've studied the Bible and you still sit in resistance to it. Look back at the text there. He says in verse 12, now notice he goes on, Nicodemus, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe them, how will you believe me? 
if I tell you heavenly things. What is he saying there? Earthly does not mean things that aren't spiritual. He's saying, Nicodemus, I'm teaching you about the rebirth that you should have known. These are things right here and now that are earthly truths that you should accept. You won't even accept those, Nicodemus. How do you expect me to take you to the glories of heaven? How do you expect me to help you understand my relationship with the Father in John 17? How, do you help, how can I help you understand the eternal nature of me as fully God and fully man in front of you? I can't give you heavenly truths because you're not even willing to accept the basics you should have known. Nicodemus is in a bad spot, is he not? He's not doing well. I mean, just imagine, and maybe you can, like I could, imagine thinking your whole life that that you were right with God. Your whole life, you have some affiliation with God. Your whole life, you kind of studied the Bible. You went to church. You read. And then to be told in a single conversation Everything you think you've known and everything you've done because you've not had a new heart and you've not been born again and you've not experienced a new birth, all of that is just one illustration after another of your resistance to God. Here's what's amazing. The Lord Jesus rebukes Nicodemus with this much strength and this much force and you almost think the text is gonna read and the Lord Jesus walked away. And the Lord Jesus went on to other ministry. And the Lord Jesus went about his business preaching to others. And yet, the text continues and the Lord Jesus is about to unfold an entire three-point sermon about himself and how Nicodemus can know him. And the question we may ask is, why would the Lord Jesus hang in there with someone that's so recalcitrant, resistant, proud, self-deceived? Why would Jesus stay in there with him when he sits in a place of resistance? Tell you why. Mercy, (laughs) grace, patience, kindness. Here's what the Lord knows. The Lord knows that the seeds of the truth that he's planting in Nicodemus' heart will be the seeds of the truth, and the Bible's described as a seed, right? The word of God that will one day bring spiritual life and rebirth to Nicodemus. You remember, we see Nicodemus in John 7, and he's softening. And by, by John 19, he's a worshiper. So what we're witnessing here, my dear friends, is we are witnessing the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory preaching a message to someone that he knows is going to walk away, but Jesus knows that someday I'm going to take those seeds that I'm planting in his heart and I'm going to make them live. And I thought about that. What a lesson for us in evangelism, right? What a lesson for us. Those of you that or ministering to your kids that they're growing up in your home and you're just throwing seeds all you can into their heart and they may sit in a spot of resistance. Those of you that have ministered and evangelized to people and they've walked away and ran away from the truth, but you know the seeds have gone into their heart. Do you know that 1 Peter 22 to 25 actually picks up John 3 and he compares the word of God to a seed? And in 1 Peter 2, that seed goes into the heart And Peter says, it causes a person to be reborn. How a person is saved and regenerated is the word of God goes into their heart. God brings it to life and the person believes. They repent of their sins and they put their faith in him. And God's brought spiritual life to them. Well, guess what? Jesus is going to keep preaching to a guy that will eventually walk away and later get saved. How many Nicodemuses do we have in our life? How many people do we need to sow seeds and trust the Lord to do the work? How many times are we tempted to say, I've preached and I've preached and I've given the truth and I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and there's just no hope. Listen, if there's air in their lungs, there's hope. Because the seed of the gospel has the power to change in nature. You understand that? I've told you this before, but it's one of my favorite all-time quotes. Dr. John MacArthur says, there's many books that can change your life, only one that can change your nature. We are seed planters. Jesus is planting the seed. Nicodemus will eventually walk away. He sits here in hardness. But we should not imagine that we should not be resilient and pursue a person with the truth of the gospel. Even if they walk away, we trust that God can make that seed come to life. Let's keep going here. So that is the introduction (laughs) that Jesus gives the you should have known sermon, uh, intro. Now, the first point of Jesus' evangelistic sermon. If you're taking note, the first point 
of Jesus' evangelistic sermon. And the first point is this. Jesus is going to say, Nicodemus, God gave me from heaven to seek sinners. Nicodemus, God gave me from heaven to seek sinners. Notice the text here, verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man, as Moses lifted up, uh, excuse me, no, no one has ascended, but as Moses descended from the Son of Man, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even though the Son of Man must be lifted up. Beloved, I think about this, and I think about the beginning of Jesus' sermon to Nicodemus, that I was sent from heaven to seek sinners. It starts even with another rebuke. I want you to notice verses 13 and 14 there for a moment. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Stop there for a second. Jesus is telling Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you may not have realized this by now, but my origin is not earth. My origin is heaven. Who you're talking to is God himself. You're talking to the God man. You're talking to notice the son of man. Look at verse 13. He says, you're talking to the son of man. And then verse 14, even so, the son of man has been lifted up. Who is the son of man? Why does Jesus use the term son of man about himself? Well, again, it's fair to say Nicodemus probably should have known about the Son of Man. Because the Son of Man is one of Jesus' favorite titles of himself, but Nicodemus would not have known that yet. But do you know in the scriptures that the Son of Man is brought up explicitly as the Messiah, as the one who would be sent from God to rule and reign over his people? In fact, you can write this down, but go later and read Daniel 7, 13 and 14, and God sends the Son of Man. The Son of Man comes from heaven to be sent to earth to be the Messiah. And so he's telling him, Nicodemus, God sent me from heaven. But what's verse 14 mean? What does it mean when he says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Let's stop for a second there. Now, if you were a Jewish scholar, we'll say, or you were a Jewish teacher... The story that is being spoken about here from the Exodus and also what is shown in Numbers is a story you may be familiar with. You may remember this, and I'll just tell you the story and um, we'll walk through it. But you remember God goes and delivers the nation of Israel, right? 400 years in Egyptian captivity. He delivers the nation, and you remember in that account of delivering the nation of Israel... God takes them through the Red Sea, they pass through it, he delivers the nation, and they go into the wilderness, and they're with their God, and they start out worshiping their God, but then what happens in the wilderness? They get a hungry stomach. They get hangry, as some people say. And they get upset with the Lord, and they start mocking the Lord. And they start saying things to the Lord in numbers. They say, Lord, why have you done this to us? Why don't you give us better food to eat? And in Exodus in the book of Numbers, we read that the Lord gets angry and his anger is burned within him and it kindles within him. And if you remember the story, what does the Lord do? He sends a bunch of venomous snakes to kill a whole bunch of the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel is watching their friends die by poisonous snakes. Now, I can think of a lot of ways I would not like to die. And on the top of the list would be chased down by venomous snakes and bit, and died. Well, you remember in the Exodus, what happens next is the nation of Israel cries out and says, Moses, Moses, please go to the Lord. Go to God and go to him and say, please stop this. And the scriptures tell us that in that moment, there was people suffering from snake bite, and they needed to be delivered. And so God says, I'll tell you what, Moses, I am going to be merciful to a rebellious, arrogant, proud group of people that are grumbling against me. And by the way, the key in those texts in Numbers and Exodus, the key there is that people were grumbling against God. Oh, what a great sin grumbling is before God. It's unbelief. And so God tells Moses, here's what I want you to do, Moses. I want you to take a, 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 an image of a snake and I want you to put it on the end of your staff and I want you to raise up that image 
of the serpent and people that look at that snake on the staff, if they're dying of being snake bit, I will deliver them even though they're proud and rebellious and they've stiff-necked my word, I will save them. I will rescue them. Now, imagine being Nicodemus. I like to think about Nicodemus in these moments and think to myself, wait a second, Lord. Are you comparing me to the nation in their worst, most rebellious season when they were the most ungrateful, most proud, most resistant, and they needed a rescue and a deliverance from God, and if he didn't act, they were gonna die in their sin? Are you comparing me to that? And the answer is yes. Yes, Nicodemus, I'm comparing you to a rebel, resistant, proud, ungrateful man. That's what I'm comparing you to. But Nicodemus, remember, as Moses lifted up that staff with the serpent on it, Me as the son of man, I'm gonna be lifted up. And he's prefiguring the cross when Jesus would be lifted up on two beams of wood to die for his people. What would have, what imagery would have flooded Moses' mind? I mean, excuse me, um, Nicodemus' mind. He would have been flooded with this idea. You're saying that I am like the nation and I need to be delivered like they were delivered, but you're not saying it's Moses that delivers me anymore. Look at the text. You're saying the son of man delivers me. Look at the text. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, the son of man. And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, there, I just gave you the whole story of that. Even so must the son of man be lifted up. Now listen, the disciples and Nicodemus, they would have not known the fullness of the cross, right? Even the disciples stumbled along trying to figure out fully what Jesus meant all the way to the crucifixion right? But he would have known this. Standing before me is one that's come from heaven. I stand before him condemned and guilty and resistant and proud and self-deceived and unwilling, and yet he's offering himself to me that he will be lifted up as my savior if I would just believe in him. You want to talk about mercy, You want to talk about grace. All Nicodemus has heard the entire time is how resistant and proud he is. And now he's being told, Nicodemus, the son of man is going to be lifted up. And look at verse 15. So that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Wow. This is the first time Nicodemus has heard some good news, beloved. (laughs) Think about that. So that, purpose. Whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Eternal life is not just quantity, is it? It's quality. It's what you will do forever, living in joy and bliss and eternity with the Lord in heaven for all of glory. Can can we just step back for a second and think about something? Think about this evangelistic prospect, Nicodemus. Jesus didn't come in and tell you God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Jesus didn't come in and give him some soft, sentimental version of John 3.16 where you're so valuable, that's why God died for you. Beloved, we're about to hit the most famous verse in the New Testament and it comes after 15 verses, 14 verses of stiff exhortation and rebuke about sin Judgment, self-deception, pride, arrogance, resistance, recalcitrant heart, needing a new nature, total inability. Jesus, the evangelist, did not just jump to the good news, brothers and sisters. In fact, I look at this and I see verse 16 and it explodes off the page for me, not because it's the classic verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Of course it jumps off the page just because it's a verse by itself, but think of it in context of the first 15 verses and think of Nicodemus hearing these words. Just think about this. He's been notified for the first time in his life he's a self-deceived lost man. He's proud, he's arrogant, he's resistant, he's ungodly, and yet he's he's really a false teacher. He's a deceiver of others in the way he teaches. All he's known is that he's like the nation of Israel, rebellious and ungodly. And then he hears this, Nicodemus, even though that's true of you and everything I've said to you is true of you, my father, God, because he's a loving God, sent me so people like you could be saved. 
What makes verse 16 explode off the page is the first 15 verses. I mean, sometimes we need to rescue sermons from being single verse sermons. John 3.16 alone is not a full picture of the gospel message. Verses 1 to 15 teaches about sin, judgment, rebellion, the need for the new birth, total inability, our pride, our arrogance, our resistance. And then what explodes on the scene is not verse 16, Nicodemus, you're so wonderful and valuable that God loved you and he sent his son for you. It's no, Nicodemus, it's not your merit or value that made God send the son. It's because God is love he sent me. Look at the text. You could translate 16 this way. For so loved God the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whoever, Nicodemus, that includes you, believes on him, falls upon him, repents of their sin, and trusts him as their savior, they shall not perish. Perish, perdition, go to hell. But they will have eternal life. Beloved, just as an aside and an encouragement to you, what makes God's love so merciful, so wonderful, so amazing, so easy to grasp and study and come out as a worshiper is only when you see it in light of your sin. It's only when we see it in light of our rebellion. It's only when we see it in light of our resistance. I mean, just this text, to think about Nicodemus sitting there and hearing, Nicodemus... God in his love sent me because he loves you. And then look at what the text says, that whoever or who might believes in him will not go to hell but have eternal life. And then 17 gives the purpose Jesus was sent. So if you wanted to put this, you could say 16 is the reason he was sent, the love of God, and 17 is the purpose he was sent. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now stop for a second and think about that. All Nicodemus has been hearing is that he's judged. All Nicodemus has been hearing is that he's guilty and he's gonna stand before God naked and alone and ashamed. And Jesus says, while that's true of you, don't forget that my purpose was to come so that you wouldn't be judged, so that you would have eternal life, so that your sins would be forgiven, so that you would know the reconciliation you can have with my father. What makes John 316, such a beautiful, amazing verse. And verse 17, so lovely to look at, is it comes in the backdrop of 1 to 15, which is all about our sin and our inability and God's judgment and our need for a Savior. When we think about evangelism, we think about ministering to people the gospel, beloved. We think about Jesus the evangelist. Let me tell you a story. Years ago, I was at a a, uh, a conference with a bunch of young people, uh, probably five, seven, ten thousand, I don't know, college students. And there was this big buzz going around kind of in the evangelical world um, that really we shouldn't preach about sin, we shouldn't preach about judgment that's super unloving, we shouldn't preach about people's need and their hopelessness and their losslessness without the Savior. We're going to discourage people and their self-esteem is going to get down and they're never going to come to the Lord. We're going to drive them away if we, if we talk about sin, if we talk about judgment, if we talk about hell. People are going to run away and they'll never come to the love of God. And I remember sitting there and this pastor was there talking, this faithful, godly man. And he went to a passage just like this in Luke 13 where Jesus looked at a whole bunch of people and says, repent or you're going to perish. Turn from your sin or you're going to go to hell. And I remember that godly man looked at these 20,000 young people, probably many of them Nicodemus-like. <laughs> and he said, don't you dare be more loving than Jesus. We need to not imagine that we need to be more loving than Jesus. Jesus' faithful evangelism involved the full counsel of God including the love and mercy of God, and it's put on stereo when you see it in the backdrop of our sin. So if you're here today, and you've heard this message, you've just heard a representation of Jesus evangelizing you. His first message is to you is you can't save yourself. You need a new heart, you need a new birth, you need a new nature. In fact, if you've never had a time in your life where 
the word of God through the spirit of God has come into your heart and made it brand new and changed your nature, new affections, new desires. A love for self has turned to a love for Christ and you don't have a devotion to the Lord's glory, you may be a Nicodemus here today. There's probably Nicodemuses in this room, Bible reading, church attending, hanging around the church that have never had the second birth. Let me encourage you to consider Jesus' first point. You need to cry out to God to do what you can't do, save you, because you can't save yourself. Secondly, Jesus would tell you, your current state is not one of neutrality. You sit at a place of resistance. Even if you sit here today, and you're like, I don't hate the Lord. I'm not against him. Listen, if you've not responded and worshiped him as Lord and bowed the knee in repentance, then you sit in resistance. Jesus says, you're either for me or against me. There's no middle. You don't get to kind of morally walk through life and grab some Bible and get some fire insurance and add a little Jesus and then you stand before him in the judgment and say, did I do good enough? He's gonna say, no, you could never be good enough. You needed a new heart. And the third point from Jesus would be, I've offered myself to you. My father sent me out of heaven because he loved you and he loves sinners and he loves to see them saved. I left heaven's glory so that you could come to know me and have eternal life. I didn't leave heaven's glory just to bring judgment on the world. I left heaven's glory so you could be saved. If you're here today and you're a Nicodemus, Jesus left heaven's glory. And if you believe on him on that cross when he died and paid for sin, it would be your specific sins that he would have paid for. And then he rose. And that was the purpose that he came. And his message to you would be believe. Believe that I am the Messiah. Turn from your life of selfishness and trust me as your Lord and Savior. And in that work, he's giving you a new heart, a new nature, new desires. If you are a believer here today, we should be very ready for communion. Because the reality is, none of us in here, while we may not have been as smart as Nicodemus, you may not have known as much Bible as Nicodemus. Your heart was the same as Nicodemus. You still had a resistant, proud heart, and it took God to act and move upon you, to soften your heart, to give you a heart to love him, or you would still be dying in your sin. When we take communion, we are thanking the Lord that he rescued us from being Nicodemuses, and he turned us in to worshipers. And so as we pray and we sing and we think about communion, let me just encourage you. If you're here today and you don't know if you know Christ and you're unsure, don't take communion. That's just one more sin you're adding up in the judgment. 1 Corinthians 11 says, do not take communion in an unworthy manner. Do not come to the Lord's table without a right heart, a new nature, confident you're born again. And then the text talks about in 1 Corinthians 11, not having unrepentant sin you're unwilling to deal with in your life, being unworthy, specifically with people in the body. So I would encourage you to take some time before you take communion, to take your heart before the Lord and thank him for his love, his mercy, his forgiveness. Believe the gospel afresh. Believe John 3.16 in light of the verse 15, verse, first 15 verses. <laughs> that that was you that he offered love to and you got his only son and you believed on him and you have eternal life and he's cleansed your heart and repent and confess. And then when you take communion today, beloved, thank him that if he would have not caused a new birth and given you the ability to believe, you would not be a worshiper here today, but you are because he acted upon you. Such mercy. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the first point of your sermon, which is that you, Jesus, you told Nicodemus, God sent you from heaven to seek sinners. God gave you from heaven to seek sinners. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for that mercy. Lord, as we prepare for communion, we confess that there are times in our life we forget what a Nicodemus we were. It seems like the further we get away from when we were saved, the easier it is for us to forget what a supernatural, miraculous work it took for you to give us a new nature, to give us a new heart, to change us from within. And so, Lord, we do pray that today we'd be exceedingly grateful for the new birth, that we believed upon you and we put our faith in you and you saved us and that we would rejoice in the glories of our salvation. As Paul calls it in 2 Corinthians, the indescribable gift is salvation. We can't even describe how grateful we are for what you've done for us. So when we take communion, may we take it with full confessional hearts. In your name we pray, amen.